Allegedly. Right? All right, so this is a uh, talk about forks, obviously. It's, uh, the title is, you never know when you need a fork. And it's, a, it's about uh, an open source project that was forked by us. And, uh, and uh, we are Valky. Did you hear about Valky in keynotes and other, yeah? Yeah, everyone knows. All right, then we don't have to. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, did you, and you all probably know about Redis as well, which which is the open source project, really famous old old open source project. Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, so this is Madeline Olson from AWS, and I'm Victor Söderqvist from Ericsson Software Technology. Um, yeah, we can start with, uh, with just what what it, so Redis. It's as I said, it's a famous open source project database since, since 2009 it was open source until March this year when it was announced that they are switching to a non-open source license and we were not late to, to decide to, to fork it and uh, with, with a few other guys, a few, many supporters and one week later uh, we were part of Linux Foundation and two weeks later we had a, our first release. Do you want to sit over here? Yeah, right, sure, 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 sure. I can, if I can, okay. Yeah. Um, so I will tell you about uh, a little bit about uh, what what it is, what what is this Valky uh, thing, and then a little bit about the history, uh, the events led, led up to this situation that we forked it. And then Madeline will tell us about um, the future plans. So, yeah, as I said, it's. Uh, for Redis, it's full compatible with the last uh, version, uh, open source version. So we just took the last commit before they switched the license. Uh, we, and uh, now it's uh, under Linux Foundation. It means it's a vendor neutral uh, governance. It's a, it's not a single company behind us. It's uh, so that it's a good guarantee to for this not to happen again. And uh, we, most of the contributors to Redis came over to our site, and. Um, yeah, we're, it's a great community. It's a lot of support already. Uh, so this is uh, the rest of the maintainers, the technical steering committee. Uh, we have Chao Chao from Alibaba. We have Madeline, Ping, Wen, and Bin Bin and me. Uh, from six different companies. Um, most of them are cloud service providers. Uh, I'm the only one from a company who, does, <laughs> who isn't. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what what, what uh, kind of thing this is. So it, it's about it's kind of database, but a traditional database. It's uh, basically it's slow because it stores things on disk, and that comes with certain guarantees, uh, which you want if you store something important like uh, money, transactions, uh, user uh, important things. But in other, other cases, you want something fast where you don't have to store something on disk. So, you, so I mean, and in a, this kind of database, its, it's writes are usually slow because you store them on disk and you want to f-sync before, before you return to the application that the write has succeeded. But reads can be faster because they can be cached on, on RAM. And then another kind of um, server is a cache server where you just drop the disk and you store everything on, on RAM. It's, it's fast. Uh, it's usually a simple key value. What happened to those bullets? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, the data is very volatile, though. So if you restart the thing, every, you lose every, all the data. So it, it can be only be used for, for a cache, basically. So. And then in memory database, it's something in between. So we have um, Valky is just, we store everything in memory, but optionally, you can also store things on disk and replicate to other, uh, other nodes, but it's asynchronous. So it doesn't slow down uh, the writes. And there is another thing here that we can uh, talk about <laughs> forks. <laughs> it's, uh, when, when we store things on, on the disk, you make a, the, use the syscall fork to fork the process. And then you get a memory snapshot where you can, you can store it on disk. Just to yeah, make some point of forks again. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I should mention that it has much more features than just to cache. It, you can have a it's a key value store basically, but the value is not just a string. It can be a data structure like a set or a queue or lots of other fancy things. Uh, geographic coordinates where you can like find the nearest, uh, for example, pick up location for a delivery, things like that. So when, when websites started to get a little bit more 
advanced um, these things were came and that's that's the time when this kind of no SQL databases also known in that, that time was like that was the best word that, so this is very old news like 15 years old ago that that's what happened and over the years more things have been added uh, so that this is a, a picture of clustering where you it, it allows the, allows the database to scale much more uh, horizontally and uh, also provides uh, high availability uh, that anyone can take over if, if some of this fails uh, can I get rid of that thing? Uh, no, that thing. Yeah. Oh, Slack. Yeah. Oh, is that the one? I don't know what to use that. Yeah, no, there it is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so there are more things like Lua scripting, and the pub publish subscribe uh, thing that you can use it at event, event uh, streams, uh, and extensibility with the uh, modules uh, like plugins on server side. So you can extend. So it's a lot of lot of extra features that have been added over the years. Uh, where are we now? Oh, what the fuck? No. no? Okay, there. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Now let's go back to the beginning. Uh, that's what I wrote on this slide, and that means 2009, when uh, this guy Salvatore San Filippo, San Filippo, Italian guy, he was uh, he had a startup where they provided uh, um, real-time web server log analysis, like analytics, what we call nowadays, uh, and they realized that it's just too slow to use a traditional database, uh, so. They, they wrote this thing up and uh, he posted it on Hacker News, probably. Um, and after some time, it re re received some attention. Uh, so some early users were uh, Twitter, GitHub, and it was popular uh, in many uh, Ruby websites and like other, other websites where you want to store some temporary data, session data, things like that. Um, uh, so that was early, and uh, then uh, it was starting to get. He, he got some sponsors, and uh, it took up more, more very much of his time. So, but he was hired later by VMware, which was, allowed him to work more full time on this in the paid paid. And they encouraged him to do it fully open source, and just uh, he was happy to to be able to do that. And later, there was this pivotal company, which kind of. I don't know if it was a, a spin-off from VMware or something similar. Um, and then um, a bit later, there was a company called Garantia Data that was started uh, started to provide a, a Redis Enterprise. It was a hosted solution based on this open source thing. And it, that was not, yeah. That, that's the ones that later became Redis Labs and now Redis, the company. But that, so that, they were not the ones that started this originally. As you can see, and they wanted to rename themselves to Redis DB at one point, but uh, Salvatore didn't re like that. So because it, they were just one of the companies that provided Redis as a service. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there were multiple companies providing Redis as a service, uh, including AWS. AWS was one of them, but there were more. Uh, and a lot more, including yeah. like at Google and other folks, including like yeah, Apple lots of companies that don't do it anymore. Like that. This was ten years ago. Um, so, um, but then after after some more years, he moved to to Redis Labs, which the, the, this company that now their name was Redis Labs in that time. Um, I don't know why exactly. Probably there was they convinced him to to they hired to to work for them and allowed him to to just work on the open source part and maintain the the thing. And yeah, I don't know. Probably was happy for, with that. Um, and then, uh, in, in uh, three years later, they actually, they acquired the copyright and the trademark from him. And we didn't find out until later that that's what happened. But well, we did know. No, we knew we knew privately it happened, but it never became public information until Redis asked us to change the trademark on Valky. Yeah. So we. Yeah. This is also the time I joined the project, so now I can give more information. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dirt. Victor's still not here yet. Yeah, I, I joined a bit later. I started like in 2021 to contribute. 
And you were in this time, like 2018, yeah, you were already yeah, yeah. 2018, March of 2019 was the ResConf that I went and open sourced the first TLS PR, which was took me two years to merge, but that was my big thing that I worked on. So Salvatore was a bit difficult to to work with. To, he wasn't. He was more seeing programming as an art. He didn't want to like. He he didn't want to spend yeah. time more like. Sal Salvatore wanted the code to be a poem. I wanted it to be secure, and that took us a while to resolve those differences. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that, when they are yeah, and the time they anyway, they promised that Redis will always remain uh, open source BSD license, whatever. Um, but at the same time, roughly the same time, Redis Labs started to release some ex extensions as open source available, non-open source. And that people started to wonder. And there were some, some posts on Hacker News and other places. And the CEO ensured everyone that Redis will remain always remain open source, BSD license. Yeah, anyway, we know where that uh, ended later. But uh, in 2020, he, Salvatore left as maintainer, as you said. He, he, I think he was just tired of... Um... Yeah, so, you know, being an open source maintainer, especially a BDFL, is a very difficult task. So he was, I don't want to speak too much for him, but he was pretty burned out and ready to do something else and happy to hand it off. Yeah, so he handed off to some of these employees at Reddit Labs, uh, which they also involved uh, two more people. One, you were one of them, Madeline, and, and Chao from Alibaba. But uh, with three people from uh, from Redis Labs, they are still in the majority. But it was kind of a... The, the first two years were really good, because I think, as was sort of mentioned earlier in the 2018 post, that Redis was pretty committed to having an open community. They were very willing to be hands-off. And kind of 20, from 2020 to 2022, we launched Redis 6.2 and Redis 7. And they were pretty good versions. We got a lot of features in them, and everyone was pretty happy with the open sourceiness of it. Yeah, and I, I started uh, contributing around 2021, and it's yeah, it was it was okay, it was good, worked well. But around 2022, they started to be like not wanting to accept things that they wanted to have in their enterprise version. They didn't want, so they started behaving more like an open core style. They started uh, to explicitly veto some features. We'll talk about a feature a little bit about observability that they explicitly vetoed. Um, and what got worse over time is they started to silently pocket veto stuff, which is to say they would just stop responding to yeah. questions about issues. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the open, open core so, problem that... When, so what uh, Victor, not Victor, Dimitri just said is that it was making stuff that was competing with some things that Redis was offering. The commercial, commercial side. Yeah, so that's always the problem with our open core project, that you don't want the open, the open source version to be as good as your enterprise version that you're trying to sell. And potentially, Amazon could have a similar problem. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> that's, uh, anyway, now 2024, that's, that's the time when uh, finally they, they, they switched to a source available license, no, no longer open source. And that's, that's like, OK, let's fork it. That's, uh, that's the time that we, we got together. And um, that's. Um, yeah, we made the fork. We made Valky. Yeah. So that's bringing up us. Oh, no, I have one more. Oh, go for it. oh, sorry. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. The fork diagram. <laughs> yes. Um, I like diagrams. Um, so uh, we start from the left. That's uh, the, the original uh, Redis, which was open source BSD license. And uh, we have these forks, Redis Enterprise, closed source, and various managed services. We never know what they are because they are not software. They're just services. They could be forks, they could be also just written from scratch with the same API. Uh, there was KeyDB, there was a fork that was created some years ago uh, with multi-threading and various things. It wasn't open source at the time, but later it was, it was acquired by Snap and they changed it back to BSD license. And it's a little bit uh, not updated and now they are supporting Valky. So I think this probably, their features will probably be merged into Valky sooner or later. The big thing is that it multi-threading, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. So the comment was, yeah, the multi-threading was the claim to fame originally. So KDB has an interesting architecture where they have a single mutex uh, for our accessing like command processing. And that gets you about two to three X performance improvement with multi-threading. And yeah. yeah. But we have another solution now. To yeah, that. ours is faster than KDB. Yeah. And we'll talk about that later. 
Yeah, Otto. And then there was uh, there was another fork called Dragonfly. It it, it it exists still, and I don't know if it's a fork. It's a dash line because it's it's in C plus plus. They took some code, but they wrote lot much of it from scratch, and it's also also multi-threaded, and it doesn't support everything. It doesn't support clustering, for example. That's true, but Dragonfly is also completely multi-threaded. It as opposed to having a main yeah. text, everything. Is. Yeah, yeah. This one is. Yeah, it, it, it scans vertically, but not horizontally. It's, uh, it's one of the alternatives, if you're considering different alternatives. And then um, there is another one, open source one from Microsoft, which is called Garnet. It's completely written in a different language, C Sharp, and it's, uh, it's MIT license, it's open source, so it's worth mentioning. It's also not completely API compatible, I think. But yeah, it's possible to use it. And then from this point, where the, where the license change happened, I drew the straight line, Valky, <laughs> because that's a... Uh, yeah, rest with for the version. Yeah. yeah. So we, we <laughs> uh, there was another there was another project started at this point called Redict, where they changed the license to a copyleft license because they thought that it would protect against something like this happening again. And I I don't think it it will because uh, these managed services they can still use copyleft. Uh, soft, uh, software to build a uh, non-open service. And uh, yeah, so what we believe in is more like we are having open governance, we are under Linux Foundation, that's a m better guarantee against a single company taking advantage and yeah, doing something bad about it. That's where I'm handing over to Madeline. Yeah, and so that brings us uh, basically up kind of to about six months ago, right after the fork happened. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about you know, the current state of the project, uh, we have f over 40 unique uh, corporate supporters of the project, and they all, you know, contribute in different ways. We talked about six companies that kind of employ the main maintainers, the TSC folks. We also have folks who just, you know, help with marketing, help with content creation, help with documentation improvements, um, as well as, you know, there's plenty of code to be written kind of across the board. So it's great to just have all these kind of companies around and as well as not just all the corporate supporters, but we've a lot of individual contributors as well. We have 87 unique code contributors to the core engine, um, which only accounts the, from the time of the fork. There's a bunch of people who also contributed code to 7.2 for Redis that never made it to an open source version of Redis. So we're happy we're able to give those people their code kind of in an open source way. Um, we also kind of have a vibrant community sort of building up around Valky outside of just the core server. After the fork happened, we also had things like clients we had to fork. Uh, since Redis is not willing to implement the features that require like new client side work to be implemented. So we also have uh, quite a few client developers who are being very helpful. I see, you know, Ivan has been a big supporter of the clients, which is great. And kind of across all of the uh, projects, we've had about 600 total commits. Um, that really kind of shows that the project is going really strong, even though it's only been going on. We haven't even hit six uh, months yet. Six months will be kind of in a couple of days. September 30th will be six months since we started the project. So I want to talk a little bit about why I think this has gone so well. Um, and I think the main reason is we had a very diverse community before the fork. Um, as we kind of talked about, I was a maintainer of Redis Open Source before the fork. Victor was a very active contributor before the fork. Um, there was an LWN article that published basically who were the top contributors to the Redis open source project right before the fork. And you can see it's, it's very diverse. You know, you see a lot of the names we talked about earlier. You see Tencent, which was one of the now maintainers, Alibaba, Huawei, and Amazon. Uh, Victor's in the unknown category for some reason. Um, <laughs> it's very prominent. He works for Ericsson, but you know, um, but, you know, it's, it's very diverse, right? We also have people willing to contribute large features. Um, one of the reasons I didn't really like this at the time is, like, I basically only contribute very big things, and so number of commits is a bad metric for that. If you go by number of lines of code, it's much bigger, but that's also important, right? We have people contributing big things and people contributing small things. Um, so the Tencent person... Uh, Bin Bin, he is one of the most helpful people to fix bug fixes and small things, like little issues. So it's like really great that we have that balance in the project. So I think that's really kind of helped, you know, right after the fork happened, we, able, we got all together and everyone was kind of still interested and excited about open source. So we were able to kind of keep going. Which sort of ties into the next thing, which was we weren't really dependent on Redis for any of our communication 
during the forking process. So we had an independent Slack channel. I actually created the Slack channel that we use today to try to convince Salvatore to add TLS, uh, since he was not very responsive on GitHub at the time. And we still use that same Slack channel today. And so since we controlled it, um, we were basically able to, I don't want to say kick out the Redis people, but kind of shift over to Valky pretty quickly. Um, me and Victor were talking about the who should actually create the fork kind of the night that Redis announced it, which is great to be able to do that and not have to worry about someone else kind of kicking you out. And the last thing I think that helped us be really successful in the fork was that we had a lot of great connections to the open source community. So uh, I personally knew people that kind of knew people at the Linux Foundation and other like Free Software Foundation, Apache Foundation, because we actually went out and talked to a lot of them kind of being like, hey, we really think we'd like to be in a foundation for this fork. And we were able to talk to a lot of them very quickly. Um, the timing of the fork was also very convenient since it was in the middle of the KubeCon uh, Europe. So a lot of people kind of, you know, I wasn't there at the time, but I heard that a lot of people were freaking out, getting into rooms in Paris, trying to like get everyone together, um, which was great in making it happen very fast. I don't think it would have happened in eight days if it wasn't during a big conference. But also, we still have a lot, we knew a lot of folks in the, you know, open source distribution process. Um, a lot of the people that sort of, we found like people kind of popped out of the woodworks and AWS and other companies sort of like willing to help and excited to help. A lot of people were very excited about Redis and like really wanting to help. And I think that helped, you know, get Valky packaged in a bunch of places really quickly. We have some folks like Jonathan here who helped package it for Alma Linux, which is really helpful. And Fedora and Apple, you yeah, know, whatever. I was trying to, you know, spot the thing you, that you have on your t-shirt, but, you know. <laughs> um, so I think all this was, like, really helpful. And it made us, you know, hit the ground running really fast and help the fork be pretty successful. But, of course, some things didn't go so well. So some things we sort of realized right after the fork is that there was a lot of stuff that wasn't actually open source that sort of hindered our progress. So the website, for example, we thought was open source. Um, was actually not. The version that we thought was the website was actually almost four years old and did not build kind of correctly anymore. So we had to sort of build something from scratch. We were lucky in the fact that some stuff was open source. All the documentation was open source. So we were able to very quickly uh, kind of move all of that over and like, you know, pull that in to generate all the website content. Uh, another big point, point, another thing that wasn't open source was performance testing. We actually relied pretty heavily on Redis the company to do performance testing for us. And kind of right after the fork, although we had the benchmarks and what they were doing generally, we weren't able to reproduce it very quickly. And it took us a long time to get to the point where we were able to do independent performance testing again. So, you know, the one takeaway we kind of have is we should have, well, we being kind of, I guess, me, because I was a Redis maintainer, I should have been pushing more to keep the project more open and less proprietary. But you said they were they didn't they weren't very helpful when you tried to contact them about things like that. That's true. <laughs> so I would like sometimes ping some of their engineers being like, "Hey, can you run the performance testing?" and they would not do it. And then they would ignore me. Which it's kind of annoying. But this was kind of kind of near the end when it felt like something was going on. The next big thing was that, uh, as I said, like, you know, things were actually going really well from 2020 to 2022. Um, everyone was really engaged, excited, willing to work on stuff. But um, decisions became a lot more opaque and a lot weirder around 2022. And we should have kind of recognized that something was going on. I kind of, kind of took the position of, I'm going to keep trying to do my best with open source. And I still think that was the right thing to do, is like try to be a good open source maintainer, regardless of what other members of the maintainer group were doing. But I think it should have been a little bit more of a red flag that something was going on behind the scenes. And the last thing that I kind of noticed was right after all the forking happened, um, a lot of people still kind of viewed this as a, you know, a big hyperscaler fork, native fork, a Google fork. But we tried really hard to keep this as open as possible. No one had, no single company has more than 16% on the technical steering committee. So it's a very distributed group. Um, and even to this day, I still have to correct people being like, no, this isn't Amazon fork. This is community fork. It's under the Linux Foundation. All that good jazz. Did you have something to say? 
it's a sixteen percent. That's one sixth, like one of one of each of us, right? That's true. Sixteen point six seven. Yeah. Okay, if you want. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs>